Coding DX is proud to be supported by AMBOSS, a medical education platform with an expansive resource library and USMLE style question bank. Hi, I'm Brianna, and welcome to Decoding Physiology from Decoding DX. Today, we're going to be talking about part two of our two-part series in calcium alkali syndrome. If you haven't seen part one, go back and watch that first, and that'll make this episode make a lot more sense. So a quick summary of the clinical presentation of calcium alkali syndrome. If your patient is symptomatic, they will have the classic hypercalcemia finds with kidney stones, bone pain, nausea, vomiting, and then confusion or headache. In the setting of calcium alkali syndrome, you can also have significant dehydration, acute kidney injury, and tingling, muscle twitches, and lightheadedness from the alkalosis itself. A lot of times patients will actually be asymptomatic, in which case you will find the calcium alkali syndrome on labs. You will see a hypercalcemia with a low parathyroid hormone and metabolic alkalosis. Key to the diagnosis here is the history, find out about dyspepsia, see if they've been taking a lot of different antacids, and you can also look for the perfect storm of a different metabolic alkalosis process with a setting of hypercalcemia. So in part one, we talked about the mechanisms of creating the problem and failing to fix the problem. And now we're gonna be talking about the pathophysiology that happens to worsen the problem and create the serious illnesses that we see with calcium alkali syndrome in our patients. To start off with, we've got hypercalcemia mediated renal artery vasoconstriction. So let's break that down. Here's the familiar structure of a glomerulus. And note that there is smooth muscle that goes around the arterioles in the afferent and efferent side that control the glomerular filtration rate. In the presence of hypercalcemia, the smooth muscle around the afferent arteriole contracts. And this leads to an overall decrease in the amount of blood flow coming into the glomerulus. This leads to a lower pressure inside that glomerulus, leading to a lower GFR. Lower GFR means overall less filtering of substances, including calcium. So calcium itself triggers this process that leads to less filtering of calcium, so less ability to excrete that calcium. Next up, we've got significant volume depletion that happens, and there's a couple different processes that contribute to this. To start off, a brief refresher on the physiology in the loop of Henle. We have the sodium potassium pump that establishes the gradients in the cell. We then have the key NKCC pump, that is what loop diuretics work on, that brings in sodium, potassium, and chloride. There's also chloride and potassium channels that are crucial for helping to maintain the concentration gradients that keep this system working. All of these different elements have to be working in order for the net absorption of fluid to happen effectively in that loop of Henle. The ascending limb of the loop of Henle also has a calcium sensing receptor, CASR. In the presence of calcium, this sensor will inhibit the potassium channel. And in the presence of hypercalcemia, this effect is even further accentuated. This then causes a backup of the system, which inhibits the other transporters, resulting in less effectiveness of that NKCC pump. On top of this, an alkaline pH further sensitizes that CASR receptor, which further potentiates the effect and makes it even worse. This is how we get what you may have heard of before as the loop diuretic effect of hypercalcemia, it's through this process that we end up having a similar effect to furosemide, where we're blocking the effects of that NKCC pump and the fluid absorption that comes with it. Over in the collecting duct, we have the V2 receptor, which binds to and responds to ADH or vasopressin. Normally when this receptor is activated, it triggers aquaporins to move into the membrane to then be able to absorb free water. In the presence of hypercalcemia, the calcium will actually inhibit that V2 receptor so that the signal never actually reaches the aquaporins and the free water is just lost into the urine. This leads to an epigenic diabetes insipidus and further worsens both the volume depletion and the hypercalcemia as we are losing free water. A major compensatory mechanism for hypovolemia is global increased reabsorption of sodium, other solutes, and water in the proximal convoluted tubule. The PCT will reabsorb bicarbonate along with other solutes co-transferred with sodium and water will follow because of electrochemical gradients. As we all have learned, water follows sodium. This process also reabsorbs calcium by something called solute drag, which basically is just because of the electrochemical gradients, it pulls calcium in normally through that paracellular transport mechanism. This entire process is, is upregulated by volume depletion because the kidney is told, hey, we need more fluid reabsorption, so reabsorb more sodium and the other solutes that come with it. So we just have a further accentuation of the process leading to more alkali absorption and then more water and calcium absorption along with it. As you can see, this results in a net further increase of both calcium and bicarbonate reabsorption, which will further exacerbate the body's state of hypercalcemia and metabolic alkalosis. Over in the distal convoluted tubule, 
Calcium is normally reabsorbed through the TRPV5 channel. This calcium reabsorption happens in concert with the gradients that are established by other pumps, including a sodium potassium and a sodium calcium pump. An alkaline pH enhances the activity of that TRPV5 channel, and so even more calcium is brought in to then be reabsorbed into the body. So again, the alkaline environment created by the calcium alkali syndrome further enhances the reabsorption of more calcium, leading to a loop system where we just keep reabsorbing and keep making the problem even worse. Finally, medications can further exacerbate the problem if your patient is taking them. In the case of thiazides, the thiazides will block that sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal convoluted tubule, but the sodium potassium pump is still functioning. So it's still creating a negative electrical gradient inside the cell, which attracts that calcium through the calcium channel. And the concentration gradient favors the sodium calcium channel to then pull in more calcium into the body. On top of all of this, the diuretic effect of that thiazide will worsen the volume contraction which then will cause more of the calcium and bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule that we just talked about. So as you can see, there's a lot of these processes attacking each part of the nephron that are further exacerbating all of the other problems, leading to the volume depletion and hypercalcemia that cause the significant illnesses that we see in our patients. So as a summary of the entire process, we start off with calcium alkali syndrome by creating the problem. We are absorbing too much calcium and alkali at the same time. Most commonly, we see this with dyspepsia in patients that are taking excess antacids. This can be Tums, calcium carbonate, or this can be other antacids like milk of magnesia combined with calcium supplements. Then the body's compensatory mechanisms fail to fix the problem. One way for this to happen is simply overwhelming the body's compensatory mechanisms by ingesting so much calcium that we overwhelm it. Or if we're in an elderly patient, the bones are simply too old to be able to compensate normally as they would in a younger adult. Finally, we worsen the problem by an all-out assault on all parts of the kidney. We start off with calcium-mediated vasoconstriction of the afferent arterial. This decreases the GFR, leading to less calcium excretion. And it also tells the kidney that there is a volume depletion, which then leads to the different effects on each separate part of the nephron. Over in the loop of Henle, we have a furosemide-like effect where we're blocking the effects of an NKCC channel, meaning that we are absorbing too much calcium without reabsorbing enough water. In the collecting duct, we have a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus by blocking that V2 receptor, leading to a loss of free water. The overall volume depletion triggers more reabsorption of calcium and bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule in an honest attempt to increase our volume, but that leads to worsening of the problem by further exacerbating the alkalosis and the hypercalcemia. That alkaline pH then increases the distal convoluted tubule's reabsorption of calcium. And finally, medications can further complicate the picture, like thiazides leading to more calcium reabsorption, NSAIDs leading to decreased kidney perfusion, and other alkaline substances, which obviously make the metabolic alkalosis even worse. I'm not covering treatment in this episode. This is simply about the pathophysiology of what happens. In general, with severe hypercalcemia, you wanna give the patients fluids to dilute the calcium until you can have longer lasting treatments to further correct the problem. Here are some references. Thank you so much for joining us. I know this can be a lot of information all at once. Please go back and rewatch. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. And don't forget to look up the treatments and stuff like that for this. We exclusively wanted to focus on physiology, but obviously treatment is really important for your patient. Hopefully knowing this physiology will make a lot of those treatments make more sense. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.